Oh, okay. We're now welcome back, everybody. We're now still in our BBG meeting, and let me turn it over to Carlos Garcia Perez, director of OCB, and his illustrious team, who's up here in Washington today. Go ahead, Carlos. Thank you. Board, welcome, guests and colleagues. Um, our last deep dive was on June twentieth, two thousand fourteen, about ten months ago. In light of the recent attempt by the United States and the Cuban government to normalize relations, we appreciate the board's sense of history by requesting that we present to you again within a short period of time. Now, I'm not saying that we want to do this every 10 months, but we do appreciate the opportunity. Like a former board member wrote to me a couple of days ago, hope you're enjoying your front seat to history. Well, Governor, we are. And it's important to note the role that some of the BBG entities have played in similar events. When the Berlin Wall fell on November 9, 1989, the feedback that our colleagues from RFERL and VOA received from those that lived prisoners of communism and in countries where the government monopolized the flow of information was revealing, encouraging, and an eye-opener for those who follow United States international broadcasting. This institution, the BBG, of which the Martis are very proud to be a part of, and yes, Mr. Chairman, we're better off today than four and a half years ago, has helped millions around the world to fight the lack of free flow information, demand the respect of the most basic human rights, get the Soviet boot off their necks, and end a very sad chapter in mankind history. Governors and colleagues, yes, we are in the front seat of a very important moment in history. More than ever, the Martis need to provide Cuba free flow of information so that our audience can make informed decisions as to their future, regardless of what this new road in diplomatic relations between Cuba and the United States leads. The people in Cuba deserve, and it's their right, to have a clear and accurate picture of the current and future events and to have the platforms to freely discuss them. So in the Martis story history, we would like to call this period going forward one of enhanced relevance. So having said that, and as a courtesy to our uh, new board members, I'm going to uh, uh, play a tape, short tape, short video, of what is the Marti, what are the Martis like in a 24-hour period? It doesn't take 24 hours to listen to that. <laughs> <laughs> you roll it, please. It's a new day in Cuba, and at the Martis. Muy buenos días, momento de comenzar esta tu revista tempranito y de mañana, la portada informativa de Radio Martí. College students from Cuba have come to express their hopes for the future. Where's the video from Cuba? Hola, muy buenas tardes. Bienvenidos a Antena Live. Desde la cárcel en La Habana, en la que se encuentra confinado arbitrariamente, el escritor disidente cubano Ángel Santi Esteban conversó en exclusiva con Televisión Martín. He conocido la isla completa. He conocido muchas personas, desde jóvenes hasta niños, ancianos. Y es bueno cuando tú te vas a un pueblo que no conoces, encuentras un joven 
y te das cuenta que este joven tiene una, un matiz contestatario. Radio Martí es la emisora que vengo yendo desde que era chiquito cuando había un radio en mi casa, ya tan roto. Y era la emisora que, que me dio una idea de cuán realmente complejo, cuán realmente desagradable era la situación en mi país. Es una tarea difícil porque es una actividad perseguida por el gobierno. De hecho, el régimen cubano ha orientado a todas las instituciones del Estado, al personal administrativo, que en ningún local de Cuba se puede grabar, no está autorizado a grabar. Y de hecho están autorizados además de eso a reprimir, que pueden arrebatarte la cámara, romperla, o sencillamente puede ir a parar a unos calabozos, a una unidad de la policía, ¿no? Decía, como te dice usted, al final con mi cámara un poco, estoy filmando en lugares así, donde han puesto estos pomitos que dicen cloro al 1%. ¿Por qué han puesto estos pomitos que dicen cloro? Botella de esto, con cloro y agua al 1%. ¿Por qué? Por, por el... Dígame, pues. Por el cólera, pero hermano, tú no, no puedes firmarlo. No puedes no firmarlo sin autorización. Sin autorización. No, no, no. autorizado de que Entonces, Limpio, estos son eh, los duplicadores que utilizamos para sacar las copias que les enviamos a ustedes para La Habana para que ustedes puedan, puedan distribuir todas las cantidades que necesitan. DVDs and flash drives of Martí content are being distributed in Cuba. Generating more content from Cuba, Latin America and around the world for the people of Cuba with the latest tools and technologies. Rewriting the traditional rules of broadcasting We are Martin. Somos Martin. Thank you. So this is the period of enhanced relevance for us, right? And we want to focus on the Martis this time around. Last time we talked about Cuba and we showed you how there's two Cubas uh, 10 months ago. We want to show you a little bit about the Martis. This is the mission of the Martis. By statute. It's a long mission. We just picked the one that we like the most. So to support the right of the people of Cuba to seek, receive, and impart information and ideas through any media, regardless of frontiers, in accordance with Article 19 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Article 19 states, everyone has the right to freedom of opinion and expression. The right includes freedom to hold opinions without interference and to seek receive and impart information and ideas through any media regardless of frontiers. This is why we exist. This is the reason why we're here. December 17 of 2014. Um, a lot of noise, a lot of media. This is what was going on with us. That's not including TV reports, radio reports, Uh, actually, Tishkin's uh, uh, team did a great job helping us. It was media day every day at the Martis, it seemed like, right, for three months. Um, I was traveling just about every, every week up the, to Washington to meet different officials and, and agencies. It was really a great period. But this is, this is what happened, right? This is the real, you have New York Times, Grandma, Broadcasting Cable. Everyone is there. We couldn't, put, we couldn't fit them all. And this is our new best friend. Bendixi and Armandi are a reputable research uh, firm in the Hispanic media. And this survey, we did not know what was going on. We did not pay for it. We know these guys. I mean, we know the, some Univision and, and Fusion and, and the Washington Post, but those are the ones that commission it. So we had no idea that this was going on. And I just want to highlight to you some of the results. There's a lot of slides on the poll, but these are the ones that I think that are more relevant to the BBG. Number one, do you always express yourself freely or do you feel that you have to be careful of what you say? 75% said, 
they have to be careful. And this is a poll done on the island. This is not uh, in Miami airport or anything like that. Two, how would you rate the Communist Party of Cuba? And this is important. This party has been, has been there for a long time without not com any competition. Slightly to very negative, 58%. Now, please look at this slide, which is the third one. How would you rate the opposition groups? Slightly very negative, 33% versus the, uh, the 58 on the other side, and very, slight, very to slightly positive, 46% the opposition groups. And as our general manager, Al Pandel, noted the other day, the Cuban media never talks about the opposition groups. And when they talk about them, they're the uh, paid mercenaries by the United States government. So this is very telling. The other slide, do you have access to the Internet? So we've been operating on the assumption that between 3 and 5% of the people in Cuba have connectivity. This is also very telling to us because we've seen it. We've seen, we've seen a growth in Internet activity. And this shows that it's 16%. By the way, we were not surprised by these, by any of these stats, but um, we were very pleased because this, is, this, is, uh, this, is, this helps, right? This is, this, is, this is big for us. What social media outlets do you use? 91% Facebook. It's limited, right? Remember, we're talking about a limited market with limited connectivity, but I can tell you we're occupying that space, and Natalia will talk to you about that. We're all over that one. And then on email, which is 3%, it doesn't seem to be much. Well, our program's uh, talent will tell you that most of the communication that they're receiving right now is through email, and it's quite substantial. Quite substantial in relative terms. Please do not think, again, we're talking about a closed society. Have you listened to, this is the, one, the most beautiful one of them all. Have you listened to Radio Marti in the last seven days? 20% said yes, and it's the last seven days. We used to do surveys, and they still talked about a soap opera that we had that was called Esmeralda in 1985. I was like, oh, God, you know, what's going on recently? So this is, this is big. If you project those numbers, there's over 2 million people only on the radio platform. That's not including the flash drives and DVDs distribution. That's not including our television um, uh, direct TV signal. So this is a floor, right? It's, we, it's much bigger than that. And if you take into consideration that 75% of the people in Cuba are scared to speak freely, I guarantee you that number is, is higher, for sure, for sure. So when the USA Today took a shot at us and said only 20% only, only of the people were listening to Radio Marti in Cuba, I almost called them back, but Tish hold me back. So you don't have 20% of the market. You're not even close. So. Our takeaways from this survey. One, the Martis are a very strong bar brand, despite of the government propaganda for the last 30 years, ladies and gentlemen. This is very big. Our strategy is working. And what is our strategy? One, provide news and programs that are relevant to the daily lives of our audience, news you can use. Two, engage our audience in the news reporting and participation of our programs across all platforms. That's been key. We're about engaging. Doesn't matter if it's in short way or whatever medium. Three, we prioritize our reporting and programming, focusing first on Cuba, Latin America, and the rest of the world. And three, which is the big picture, which is the one that we've been talking about for a while, the government continues to lose control as citizens of Cuba continue to lose fear and demand more from their government. Those are the more salient, those are the takeaways that we get from this uh, survey. The survey has a lot of other data, but that's our, that's our, that's our takeaway. I want to um, present to you Natalia Crujedas now, who's our chief content officer. She used to be, 10 months ago, our digital director. She's now the chief content officer. She has two jobs, same salary, it's great. She's very efficient. Um, she's doing a wonderful job, so Natalia, please take it away. Hopefully we can talk about same salary conversation later. But yeah. Good morning. And thank you for this opportunity to let you know what has happened to the Marti since we last spoke uh, almost ten, nine, ten months ago. The chief content officer uh, position was created to consolidate our news gathering and content production efforts and to better and more efficiently utilize our resources. 
Today, we're a platform agnostic content production center, and our journalists produce multimedia content that is then adapted and distributed to our different um, me medias of distribution. As Carlos started talking to you about, on December 17, the US and Cuba announced their plans to reestablish diplomatic relations. But let's be clear, diplomatic relations, um, broader licenses for trade and travel, and lifting some sanctions against Cuba have had no effect on the Cuban government discourse. Human rights are abused every day. Access to information is limited and heavily controlled. And all media is owned and operated by the state. Hum um, Cuban officials dealing with the White House may have changed the tone of the conversation. But the Castro's uh, dialogue and their discourse inside the island and the relentless media campaign has not budged. Just a few weeks ago, during the Summit of the Americas in Panama, um, Cuban television did coverage of what was happening, and this is a, their version of what happened there. Y de inmediato hacemos contacto en vivo con nuestros enviados especiales a Panamá para conocer detalle. Cuando ya ha caído la noche, nosotros continuamos aquí en el hotel de igual nombre donde sesionaron los foros de la... Hemos encontrado en este foro eh, de la sociedad civil la presencia de un grupo de mercenarios. No han podido evitar que un grupo de mercenarios que no son disidentes políticos, que no son personas que aportan esa realidad social, que son agentes pagados por potencias imperiales, but what was happening was this. Esta es su verdadera naturaleza, la naturaleza excluyente y tolerante que si la manifiestan aquí, aquí es un país democrático, los observadores o, o, eh, imparciales pueden imaginar qué es lo que pasa en Cuba y qué son capaces de hacer en Cuba donde tienen todo el poder. The same old fashioned strategy to silent dissent. Pro Castro mobs and Cuban security agents attacking civil society groups. Cuban media didn't show any, any of this, but we did. They're waging a full blown campaign to damage the reputation of, of dissident leaders. All tactics in which the battle of ideas generates more heat than light, where he who is the loudest wins the argument. The truth is that most international media are unaware of the nuances of the Cuban phenomenon and cannot distinguish real civil society representatives from the Cuban government yes men that try to represent themselves as the civil society. And we do at the Mortis. And I want to talk to you a little bit about the type of content that we cover and the stories that, that we're interested in. We look for stories that are empowering. We give our audience information that would otherwise not be accessible to them and that basically provides tools, resources to make their everyday lives better and easier. We look for stories that are inspiring. Examples of how the civil society creates new opportunities for itself, the nascent business community, the development of the, of the private enterprise. And stories that are aspiring. You know, we all have hopes and dreams and, and we look for those stories that will inspire and, and, and give that hope to our audience. And I wanna show you a couple of examples of the stories that we have covered recently. This is La Edad de Oro, is one of Cuba's psychiatric facilities. It's administered by the government and it depends largely on the charitable assistance of nuns. And it was precisely those groups of nuns that reached out to the Martis in desperation, hoping that this information would be brought to the light after the several attempts that they came to the authorities asking for them to take actions. Or more aspiring stories like I just mentioned. This is, um, our coverage of the recent municipal er elections in Cuba that were very unprecedented because two opposition leaders like this gentleman were allowed to run for office after the community voted them as eligible candidates. This is a very unique situation in Cuba. It was a perfect opportunity to the Martis to show how opposition groups are gaining ground as Carlos explained to you in the, in the poll presentation. One of the candidates, Juni Lopez, told us that the process was very difficult for him because he had to compete against the whole system. When he was facing a repudiation rally, which is basically an active mob harassment by government agitators, which is a very common situation in Cuba, 
in a virtually unique situation, his neighbors, his co community came out to support him and cheer him on. Again, an example of how the civil society are losing fear. Our strategy in content is paying off. The Martis are becoming the primary source of information about Cuba to many news outlets inside the island and outside the island. We see a continuous growth in our website traffic. This is a trend in the last fiscal year only on our desktop. We also have mobile and apps. For the first three months of this year in 2015 compared to last year, we can see not only almost double in the traffic of the daily visits, but we can see a huge increase in the page views, in the interest of our audience looking inside our website. Um, we engage in social media. Facebook, as Carlos told you, is one of the favorite uh, platforms for Cubans. On a daily basis, we have perhaps 30,000 in reach, people reaching in Facebook. On a good day like this one, we had almost 300,000. Uh, the last nine months, our traffic and our, our likes in, in Facebook and our followers have grown more than 70%. And we see a considerable trend in Twitter, which is different in Cuba because they, they tweet blindly. They just push, they cannot engage. We promote independent journalism with platforms like Reporta Cuba. Um, it's a portal that we've developed a year ago. We pretty much have cultivated citizen journalists in every province in the island, and our journalists engage, curate, and amplify their reports through social media. So there's no better way for us to talk to you about the impact of our content than through the words of our audience. So I invited you to see this video that came from the island. Radio Martí, no es en realidad lo que dice el gobierno. Como ellos lo tildan, lo tildan de, de Radio Mentí. Y en realidad la tele mentí es eh, Radio Martí, la voz de la verdad, la voz de los cubanos, la voz de los que no tienen voz. Para mí, mi vida cotidiana, lo que es Radio y Televisión Martí es eh, que vivimos muy informados con ella. Eh, una, una emisora muy amiga de todos los cubanos. Es eh, emisora amiga y, y que vivimos informados por, la, por, la, por Radio y Televisión Martí. Yo empecé a escuchar, con una, con una grabadora, grabadora que yo tenía, yo empecé a escuchar esa emisora. Por ahí fue que yo entonces me fui dando cuenta de la verdad. Y ahí lentamente, lentamente, hasta que me abrí y me di cuenta de que era un mundo paralelo donde existían las grandes injusticias. Tú buscas de esa, de, de esa eh, televisión o de esa emisora la verdad para tú sacar tus propias conclusiones como persona como tal de lo que está surgiendo en tu propio país o de lo que puede surgir también en otro país que ya hoy por hoy no lo brindan estos, estos, estos señores que hoy manipulan lo que es la... la La, 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 la información en la televisión en este país. This is very exciting. This is how with real truth sound journalism you can change hearts and minds. We're very proud of our content, but the reality is that without good vehicles to make this content available on the island, we're going nowhere. We've all heard the expression that content is king. And I like to say that distribution is queen and she's the one wearing the pants. <laughs> so <laughs> To talk more about our distribution efforts and how we're being very creative uh, at the Martis, I'm going to pass the microphone to our headquarters in Miami, where my colleague Oscar Rodriguez, director of Ready Martis, is waiting for us. Good morning, Oscar. Adelante. Good morning, Natalia. It's a pleasure to be here. It's nice to see you all again. During our last deep dive, we discussed some of the myths surrounding the Martis, including how no one watches TV Marti listens to Radio Marti, and how the people are just too afraid to talk to the Martis. Now that those myths have been thoroughly debunked, let's take a closer look at the reality on the ground and how we're dealing with the events that are affecting the future of Cuba here at Radio Marti. We talked about the very rapid changes taking place in Cuba. Changes in travel, cell phone use, email and texting capabilities, as well as government-sanctioned entrepreneurship. We also talked about what was not changing, such as the degree of isolationism, censorship, minimal connectivity and slow digital adoption, and continued human rights violations. Since our last deep dive, we've continued our strategy to stay ahead of the game, to anticipate the next opportunity. The events of December 17th were truly a game changer for the US and Cuba relations, but we weren't caught off guard. We were ready. The situation in Cuba just hasn't changed. 
the need for accurate and balanced information has never been more important than it is today for the people of Cuba. For our audience, we're more relevant than ever. Radio Marti has continued to expand upon a strategy of diversifying the content distribution spectrum to cater to different demographics on the island, from shortwave and AM broadcasting to FTP downloads, and now to satellite radio broadcasts. De lunes a viernes, de 9 a 11 de la noche, por el canal 153 de Sirius XM. Canal 153. Radio Martín, vía satélite. As new capabilities become available, we'll make those tools available to our audience. We're always anticipating the next opportunity. We're always staying ahead of the game. Unfortunately, there just isn't enough time to tell you everything we've been working on. But here are a few examples. Since December 17th, we've created a weekly program called Puente, which translates to bridging. The program is for the people of Cuba to explain new developments in the U.S.-Cuban normalization efforts. The Cuban government doesn't provide updates on the efforts or what they mean for their people. So this program serves as a unique vehicle to address the latest progress and creates a forum for our audience to ask questions and request more detailed information pertaining to the normalization efforts. Responding to the needs of our audience, we continue to make enhancements to our weekday and weekend programming and continue to increase the degree of engagement for each program through social media, including Facebook, Twitter, SMS texting, email, and as well as traditional vehicles such as phone calls and mail. We can now be heard on TuneIn and will very soon be available on iHeartRadio. We continue to be vigilant of the creation of new apps for engagement, and we'll make them available through our distribution network on the island. Furthermore, we've doubled our efforts on the island to engage our audience and to generate content from Cuba on all platforms. Emails are now the principal vehicle for our listeners to communicate with us. Listeners regularly send pictures with their emails due to the low cost and the expanded email capabilities on the island. As an example, one of our radio programs, Con Vos Propia, now receives more emails from listeners using Nauta accounts than any other source. Nauta, of course, is the Cuban government's email service to cell phones on the island. But are these efforts to engage and penetrate working? Here are just a few examples of people who live and work in Cuba participating in our programming. Please let me reiterate, these are just a few examples of listeners who work in the official media and arts and entertainment fields and participate in our programming. In the last few months, Radio Marti has begun live streaming our content into Cuba via satellite radio through Sirius XM. For the very first time in our history, we're broadcasting in CD quality without any interference to the entire island. Also, we're now providing six hours of programming daily to Cuba through FTP downloads, and we'll expand the number of download sites and hours of programming in the next few months. We're also in the process of creating programming specifically tailored to those platforms. As new opportunities arise in emerging technologies on the island, we'll be ready to use that technology to further distribute our content and engage the people of Cuba in the free flow of information. But the Marquis aren't just engaging the people of Cuba with a full spectrum of news and information programming. We also work with other federal agencies to provide valuable information on behalf of the entities such as the U.S. Interest Section in Havana, the State Department, and public service announcements from the Center for Disease Control on dengue, chikungunya, Ebola, and cholera prevention. The video you're about to see, produced in conjunction with the U.S. Coast Guard, addresses the perils of illegal immigration in the Florida Straits and reinforces the official stance of the U.S. government on illegal immigration. Let's take a look. Al menos 271 balseros cubanos han sido interceptados en el estrecho de la Florida, que se ha convertido en un acoso y largo cementerio. Solo que se habían tirado muchos, pero de ellos no se sabe nada. El cadáver fue uno de los cuatro que guardacostas encontraron flotando en los callos de la Florida. Entre ellos, una mujer embarazada, uno de los cubanos.
urbanos fue hallado muerto. Era un menor de edad y perdió la vida a causa de deshidratación. La Guardia Costera anunció haber suspendido la búsqueda. Ellos se enteran del amigo que llegó, pero no se enteran de los que quedan en el camino. Que no se lancen a esa aventura porque no todos son los que llegan. Vale más la vida que arriesgarla. Esos muchachos dejaron niños, dejaron padres que están desconsolados. Desconsolado. Esto es algo bien difícil de aceptar. Que no lo hagan, por favor, que no lo hagan. Miren el dolor de nosotros. El gobierno de los Estados Unidos de América no apoya la inmigración ilegal. Es política del gobierno de los Estados Unidos promover una inmigración ordenada y segura. Let me give you another perspective about the survey that Natalia and Carlos talked about earlier. If you consider that the survey takes into account a very specific period in which important events such as the Summit of the Americas in Panama and Cuba's status on the State Department terror list were consistently in the news, I think it's even more reassuring because it essentially says that a sizable number of Cubans inside the island seek out Radio Marti as a serious and reliable source of valuable information. For 30 years, the Martis have built the trust of our audience, finding new ways for our audience to express themselves, create new vehicles for content delivery, and making sure our content is relevant, reliable, and accurate. This is how we continue to impact the market. This is how we build our audience every single day. Well, thank you very much, and I'll be available for any questions you may have at the end of the presentation. And now we're going to send it back to you in Washington. Carlos? Oscar, thank you so much. Great job. Next is the um, principal anchor of our newscast, our flagship newscast, Antenna Live. Uh, you've probably seen her on the press because she got uh, she had a little incident in Panama. Uh, let me say this. She's not only a television reporter. She's a multimedia journalist. She's done a fantastic job, a fantastic job executing our strategy. So I present to you Ms. Karen Caballero. Thank you, Carlos. Hello, everyone. It's really a pleasure for me to be here with you today. Thank you for allowing me the opportunity to talk to you directly about something that's very important to me. First, let me apologize for my accent. As you can see, English is not my first language, but I'm trying my best, and I promise you it's going to be better. <laughs> anyway, today, I want to talk, talk to you about the impact that the Martins are having inside Cuba across the political and social spectrum. I was raised in Cuba. I was born into a family that on my mother's side was a pillar of the Cuban revolution. My grandfather was an ambassador. My grandparents believed and worked hard for the so-called values of the Cuban revolution. They really had faith in what Fidel Castro promised the Cuban people back in 1959, a fair society, equality for all. However, as I'm sure you know by now, Castro soon betrays those values and the revolution. Fortunately for me, I was born into a family that was a microcosm of the rest of Cuban society. On one side, my grandparents, who were true believers. On the other side, my father. He's an engineer with a doctorate in science, a university professor who publicly broke with the system in Cuba. And let me tell you, I'm very proud of that and of him. I personally witnessed the forces that form the Cuban reality today those events definitely shaped my life. In the meantime, I went to school, of course. I started violin since the age of eight and became an accomplished musician in one of the best music schools in Cuba. Some, year, some years later, my family came to the United States. And let me be clear, we were well off in Cuba. And why am I saying this? Simply because we came as political, not economic refugees. The beginning in the US, as you can imagine, wasn't easy. As most immigrants, we were very poor and had to adapt to a completely new life. But we were very thankful and still are, and determined to take advantage of the opportunities that this great country offered us. In the US, I went to the University of Miami with a full scholarship. And then after graduating from the Frost School of Music, I went on to earn a master's in journalism. I'm also extremely proud to be a recipient of the Burke Award that this agency has gracefully given to me and I take this opportunity to thank you again for that. And I also must say that last year, another Cuban, but he's an independent journalist in the island, Rolando Rodriguez Lovaina, was also honored with this prestigious award. Now you might be 
asking yourselves, why is she telling us all this information? Let me explain. <laughs> it's simply because as a Cuban who came of age inside the communist system and who understands the realities on the ground, I am very proud of being part of the Martis because every day we help break the Castro's monopoly of information to the Cuban population. I do believe in this mission, and I always did. En otras palabras, ¿qué miedo nos tienen, señores? In plain English, we scare the hell out of them, and I love it. <laughs> With that, I have prepared something to give you a little perspective of how much the Cuban government really fears our work. Let's see. Es el inicio de un proceso hacia la normalización de las relaciones, pero esta no será posible mientras exista el bloqueo. No se devuelva el territorio ilegalmente ocupado por la base naval de Guantánamo, las transmisiones radiales y televisivas violatorias de las normas internacionales. During last month's summit of the community of Latin American and Caribbean heads of state in Costa Rica, del terrorismo internacional, Cuban leader Raúl Castro demands the Martí operation be terminated as a condition of normalizing relations with the United States. Cuba está dentro de esas plataformas subversivas. Conocidos son los proyectos piramidales y sus zonas orientadas. In recent days. Castro's heir apparent, Miguel Díaz Canel, openly criticized Piramideo, the Martí's SMS-based social media platform, then again railed against the Martí operation and demanded its closure. Habría que sentarse a discutir también, entre otras cosas, sobre los temas de las transmisiones ilegales de radio y televisión desde los Estados Unidos hacia Cuba. And lastly, the front page of the official Cuban government newspaper, Granma, desperately once again called for the closure of the Martins. The Cuban government fears an operation that is exclusively focused on the Cubans' daily reality because we make it very difficult for them to obscure the truth. Recently, we personally witnessed how the Cuban government fears us. It was the recent summit of the Americas in Panama, where the Cuban government agents had physically beaten members of the dissident community. On the last day, my cameraman and I had entered a Cuban government press conference to which credentialed media had been invited. As soon as we entered the room, Cuban officials recognized me and became visibly agitated. Moments later, after protesting to the authorities, we were escorted out. They simply did not want Martí personnel participating. We are the voice of the voiceless on the island. This is the reason that on a daily basis, Cubans contact us directly to expose the injustices inherent in the system. Our principal role is merely to produce good journalism. Every day, we speak truth to power. Oh yes, we do. We speak truth to power. And as you know, there's no stronger weapon than the truth. That's what we work for every day for that truth that every Cuban in the island deserves. That is why the Cuban government fears our work so much. Thank you. I know everybody's proud of their team, but I'm very proud of my team. So uh, thank you so much uh, to all of you. And in Miami. What now? This is a big question, right? Because everybody's talking about December 17th. It's the end of the world, you know. Um, so in terms of the BBG, in terms of the Martí's focus, right, there's no free flow information on the island. Article 19 today, ladies and gentlemen, still applies. Two, the need for strong and accountable institutions in the country and Latin America. 
and the Martis are an asset to the United States and the region. This is our takeaway. This is how we feel very strongly about our role um, serving the United States and, and the region. So thank you so much for listening, paying attention, watching. We're ready to answer questions. You, thanks, Carlos, to you, you and your team. It's great. Thank you for traveling up here from, from Miami. Um, when we did our deep dive 10 months ago, I was about as sick as I've ever been. So this is my first deep dive. I don't remember anything about that day. Um, but uh, it, it is it, just a comment. You know, the, the board, we, we go to dinner the night before our meetings, and we often, and I know a lot of, a lot of the heads of the entities were there last night, and it's, it's interesting to speak about places around the world where we declare victory and then show up a couple of years later and find it's a complete mess and what we thought we accomplished didn't get accomplished, whether it's, you know, Iraq or Libya or whatever. And I think what you say about December 17th and about Cuba is, is very, very important to this organization that probably the things we're doing now more than ever are more important now, um, that relations are normalizing because it hasn't become a society where there's freedom of expression, freedom of uh, – of journalism, so I think, you know, there's a ten there's a tendency to want to say, okay, our work is done. Let's move on to elsewhere in the world. I think we understand as a board here that our work, in many ways, is just beginning. But congratulations to you and your team for the work you've done so far. It's really kind of inspiring to see. So Thank you. that's just a comment. I don't have a question. I'll throw it over to my, the rest of my my board members to ask questions. Um, but thank you for being here. Rob, Rob Bull is always good for a question. <laughs> um, so, Carlos, so project – a lot of people are talking about what's happening right now and, and, and post-December 17th and the changes that the United States is going through in terms of its relationships with Cuba. But project down for us two years from now and where you think Marti needs to go, continue to go, go and grow, especially if, you, if your assumptions are that the government is continuing to lose control of the information environment – how does Martini need to change, continue to change, to be able to help structure a new information environment in Cuba? That's a good, very good question. And like Natalia said, our biggest challenge is distribution. Um, I think we have a great responsibility, great responsibility to adhere to the most strict journalistic standards, number one. Number two, our programs need to continue to be relevant to the daily lives of our audience. You and I have talked about this before. We feel like December 17th, in terms of our strategy, had no effect, because we are ahead of the game in many ways. So we would, we would evolve as, as the, as the uh, circumstances on the island change, as there's more openness, we'll do more things. That's how I see it. Um, but other than that, it's just focusing on our audience, on their needs, and, and what's relevant to them. Let me follow up by saying, you know, I, I, I guess in many ways, Marti is the largest and most well-funded independent media organization involved in Cuba at the moment. But we could see that might be changing in the future. That could change in the future. We hope it would change in the future, that other organizations need to be supported and grown. I know you've done a lot of work in general of supporting content creators and encouraging them to be content creators in Cuba, how do you see your role of in, in nurturing the next generation of journalists in Cuba, the next generation of media organizations in Cuba, next generation of filmmakers and, and artists? Thank you. So as you know, Rob, we are doing that right now so that when there's more space on the island and, and when there's free flow of information and independent outlets can come in, they would have a skilled workforce on the island that they could hire and they can create space and provide uh, news and information. So we're doing that now. It's a slow process. A lot of people, I'm so glad you asked that question. A lot of people are very excited when they were seeing the reports from CBS, ABC, NBC News, and people are telling us, everybody's in Cuba. Why, why do you have to be there? Well, those reports were not broadcast in Cuba. Those reports were broadcast to the United States, one, two. It would be very easy for us to go get some of, the, of the, the staff and the producers and the cameraman that maybe CBS, ABC, and NBC hire on the island because they probably some of them work for the government, that would be the easy part. We're grinding it out. We're starting from journalists from ground zero 
They probably don't know what a, I don't know, what a broadcast is, and we're training those. Because we really believe, and going back to what Natalia said, we need to have 11 million independent journalists on the island. We don't want to have 10, 30, 40, 50, 60. Everybody on the island should be a journalist and should have the capacity to create content. That's why connectivity is so important for us, and that's why the training that's taking place right now is crucial to the future of the island. Thanks. Ryan, go ahead. Uh, thanks, Carlos. Uh, great presentations all the way around. Uh, you do us proud. Thank you. Um, as you point out, the government is losing probably its most powerful weapon against its own people, which is the power to intimidate and instill fear. Um, the future can unfold in a number of ways. One of them would be uh, a soft transition, if you will, um, or it could be a hard transition uh, where the regime collapses or is overthrown. Um, are you thinking through uh, what, what Marti would do in the latter scenario uh, where uh, it comes apart overnight, um, there is no new order, uh, state of, of chaos? Are, are you thinking through those contingencies? We are, and that's why, um, actually, I want to point out that uh, Greg Marville here from Southern Command is here. Uh, we're not in the military business, but we have a relationship with them. Um, and that's why we have these relationships with all U.S. agencies, Ambassador, so that we are ready to communicate um, whatever message needs to be communicated so we can report on the ground what's going on to the people in Cuba so there's no a tremendous instability on, in, in the country. But let me, let me uh, expand a little bit on this. I think we need to think long-term in the region, and we think long-term in the Martis. We're not, so we're ready for any scenario that comes in play, and I'm not overselling it. We follow our strategy, and we don't react. We react, for example, to December 17th, we reacted to it as an important event, but we were ready, and it falls along our strategy. But we have to think long-term. Cuba is a, is a country that's in transition right now. And like you very point, uh, you're inferring with your, with your question, so we don't know where the chips are gonna fall here. And we need to think long-term. We need to help the people in Cuba understand and at least edu you know, receive instructions, not instruction, that's not the right word, L receive information as to what, you know, so they can make an educated decision as to their future within those scenarios. And I think that applies to the entire region. So what I would, what, what I would hate to see happen is that somebody like Chavez takes over in Venezuela, and all of a sudden we have to react to, to somebody like Hugo Chavez, which we should have known a long time before that that was gonna happen. So that's the way we look at it. It's a long-term long proposition, being ready for our contingencies like you're pointing out. So we're, we, we, think, we think about all these things. We can't think about every contingency, as you very well know, because we don't have a, the crystal ball, but we're ready for it. A perfect segue to my question. Talk about Venezuela a little bit. I mean, Venezuela and Cuba have always been kind of hand in hand with with uh, their dependence on each other. How does what's happening in Cuba impact what's happening in Venezuela, and what role, if any, can Marti play in Venezuela? Well, we we cover Venezuela uh, in detail because the people in Cuba care very much about Venezuela. Uh, historically, they have had a relationship, and there's also there's an economic benefit in the relationship. That economic benefit has been in, in jeopardy, if you will, for the last, uh, I don't know, let's say 12 years, uh, 12 months. Um, and, and we actually think that that's one of, the, one of the elements, if you will, that took the Cuban government to do in trying to normalize relationship with this country. Um, I think Venezuela, when it comes out of, out of this stage, if you will, at this stage, is going to be a very strong country. I think Venezuela has very strong leaders. We saw them in Panama, actually. We saw activists in uh, Pan uh, Venezuelan activists in, in, in 
in Panama. They're very, very forceful. Uh, great leadership. Actually, one of them is in jail. Two of them are in jail right now. Um, I think when that gentleman comes out of jail, he's going to clean. I mean, he's going to be, he's, he's done the right thing. So I think Venezuela, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's an issue right now. It's a problem. But, Mr. Chairman, I think they're doing the right thing in terms of, again, thinking long and establishing a long-term uh, country political system. And they're going through tremendous sacrifices. Um, but it's very, it's very tied one to the other. And we, are, we make sure that our audience knows exactly what's going on in Venezuela. We've had, we've had um, stringers there for the longest time. Actually, when things were very, very hot there, we had to rotate stringers because they showed up on the Marti screen and they would not come again. But, you know, and VOA also has done um, some coverage there. So um, that's the way we see it. Any other questions? Andre? Carlos, um, for the longest time, um, the Cuban system was supported by the, the former Soviet Union from an economic standpoint, I mean, to the tune of billions of dollars. Uh, and more recently, that has been replaced by the, the petrodollar from Venezuela. With the, uh, the recent collapse in the price of oil and with the internal turmoil inside of Venezuela, what do you think is the scenario if uh, Venezuela is no longer able to assist Cuba economically and if the realities on the island come crashing down? They'll get closer to us. They'll get closer to us. And the Chinese, as you know, are around, but the Chinese don't give you money for free. You have to pay. Cuban government doesn't like to pay. It's a different scenario, right? So they, they got subsidies from the Soviet Union for many years, never paid them back. They got this great deal with the Venezuela, never paid them back. I, I think their, their options are closing, and I think that's also that's a, that's a tremendous engine uh, for them to get closer to the United States. Great. Any other questions, Carlos and his team? Carlos, we want to thank you and, and the rest of the team for coming up here to, to D.C. today and, uh, and doing this deep dive. And next year we'll be back down in Miami, which will be, which will be fun. It's not as nice as Prague, but the weather's pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> Someday, hopefully, we'll be in Havana doing this. Oh, thing. that would be great. Oh, yeah. That would be nice. Cheers to so, that. Thank you um, so much. Appreciate it. Thank you, guys. Thank you very much. So our morning is going to continue in a couple minutes, but actually the board meeting is going to end because we're going to lose a couple board members and we're going to, at the risk of losing quorum, uh, we're actually going to end the board meeting in a second and then continue um, the morning, but not as a full board meeting. So let me just dispense with the kind of the, the quick housekeeping as a second and then we'll head downstairs to, to, to speak with Walter. So believe it or not, this is the last board meeting in the Cohen building this year. Um, our next board meeting is going to be at the RFERL headquarters. Um, John and Nainat are hosting us in, in Prague on July 1, uh, and we'll be doing a, a review and a deep dive of RFERL uh, there in Prague, and we'll be working with Susie and, and, and Andre and, and, and Rob to put together an agenda for the rest of that meeting. And then I think when we come back, we have a meeting in Springfield at MBN, followed by a meeting at, at RFA. So uh, we're kind of making the rounds right later this year and then hopefully Miami, you know, the beginning of next year. So um, we're, what we're going to do in a second is we're going to move downstairs to the v VOA briefing room for a conversation with Walter Isaacson. Um, but for now, let's, as I said, let's, let's adjourn the meeting. Does any governor move that we adjourn? Karen moves. Is there a second? Second by Matt. All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? The meeting is adjourned. I'll join everybody 15 minutes downstairs in the VOA briefing room. Thank you.